David Foster Wallace is known for his difficult novels and nonfiction. So how did Wallace feel about all the readers out there who weren't smart enough to read his books? And I first started reading David Foster Wallace when I was 18 years old, and his intensity and depth and the difficulty of his novels pushed me to the next level of my reading career, but it was not easy. 18-year-old Ian could barely understand at times what the hell was happening in Infinite Jest. And I'm excited for today's video because Wallace talks at length about this and goes over not just the decline in reading ability in our post-literate world, but what we can do as writers, as people who are into literature and stuff in this world. And if you guys want more content on David Foster Wallace and the greatest books and authors of all time, then of course you should subscribe, excuse me, to Write Conscious, which is the headquarters of David Foster Wallace, of Cormac McCarthy, and so many other great authors here on YouTube. And so let us hop into this quote by Wallace. Personally, I think it's a really neat time. I've got friends who disagree. Literary fiction and poetry are real marginalized are real marginalized right now. There is a fallacy that some of my friends sometimes fall into. The old, the audience is stupid. The audience only wants to go this deep. Poor us. We're marginalized because of TV, the great the great hypnotic blah blah. You can sit around and have these pity parties for yourself. Of course, this is bullshit. If an art form is marginalized, it's because it's not speaking to people. One possible reason is that the people it's speaking to have become too stupid to appreciate it. That seems a little easy to me. If you, the writer, succumb to the idea that the audience is too stupid, then there are two pit pitfalls. Number one, the avant-garde pitfall, where you have the idea that you're writing for other writers, so you don't worry about making yourself accessible or relevant. You worry about making it structurally and technically cutting edge, involuted in the right ways, making the appropriate intertextual references, making it look smart. Not really caring about whether you are communicating with a reader who cares, something about that feeling in the stomach, which is why we read. Then the other end, end of it, in very crass, cynical, commercial pieces of fiction that are done in a formulaic way, essentially television on the page, that manipulate the reader, that set out grotesquely simplified stuff in a childishly riveting way. What's weird is that I see these two sides fight with each other, and really they both come out of the same thing, which is a contempt for the reader, an idea that literature's current marginalization is the reader's fault. The project that's worth trying to trying is to do stuff that has some of the richness and challenge and emotional intellectual difficulty of avant-garde literary stuff, stuff that makes the reader confront things rather than ignore them, but to do so in such a way that it's also pleasurable to read. The reader feels like someone is talking to him rather than striking a number of poses. Part of it has to do with the living of living in an era when there's so much entertainment available, genuine entertainment, and figuring out how fiction is going to stake out its territory in that sort of era. You can try and confront what it is that makes fiction magical in a way that other kinds of art and entertainment aren't. And to figure out how fiction can engage a reader, much of whose sensibility has been formed by pop culture, without simply becoming more shit in the pop culture, excuse me, pop culture machine. It's unbelievably difficult and confusing and scaring, but it's neat. There's so much mass, mass commercial entertainment that's so good and so slick this is something that I don't think any other generation has confronted. That's what it's like to be a writer now. I think it's the best time to be alive ever, and it's probably the best time to be a writer. I'm not sure it's the easiest time. And so this statement is actually one of the most genius things I've ever heard Wallace say. Like, this breakdown is beautiful because... The whole reason I created this channel, the whole reason I write is not to be smart or to be better than anyone else or make people think I'm smart or any of that. It's actually to set the bar of expectation just a little bit higher for this post-literate world because most people out there are not into reading. If you just look at this, uh, the stats on reading, but most people do know how to read. Po most people read books in high school, maybe a couple books since, you know, listen to podcasts now. And if they wanted to, if they cared enough, they could find the ability to train themselves pretty fast, I would say in a month or two, to be able to read most pieces of fiction. You know, maybe not something as complicated as like Gravity's Rainbow or Infinite Jest immediately, but they could easily read most works of fiction. And if they tried that just at a easy level, just after work, you know, before bed, just a little bit on the weekend and stuff, they could within a year be able to maybe tackle something like Infinite Jest or Gravity's Rainbow without too much trouble. And so we're almost dealing with this world full of sleepers, these kind of Manchurian candidates who are just ready to be awakened. But there's an inherent um, monetary dilemma at, you know, at the heart of all this which is if you look at booktubers or even authors, the easy money is meeting people, those people at their level. If you look at the whole book talk phase, uh, fad and like a lot of booktubers are like some of the popular people like Wendy Goon talking about books. He's meeting these people at their level. But the problem with that is 
is that when they engage with a thought leader or a book, they're going to um, absorb that and all that's going to flow downstream. For instance, I have no idea a lot of the time what the hell Cormac McCarthy or David Foster Wallace is trying to get at in some of their scenes or in even some of their books. And so all my interpretations are kind of downstream from the priming effect of Cormac McCarthy. I'm trying to strive to be as good as him, but it flows downstream. But what's great about um, people like Wallace and McCarthy is even if I'm a little bit downstream, I'm still in a really good spot. But if I am downstream of a quarter of, of Thorn and Roses, which is one of the most popular fantasy fantasy series in the world right now, written by Sarah J. Moss, then I'm not, I'm like in the swamp. I was already in the swamp, but now I'm just going further and further into the muck. And so our job as authors, as people who are into literature and talk to others about literature, is to set that bar high enough. Because when you go work out with your friends, right, the reason you're there, if you have a friend who's never worked out before, you're obviously there to help them with their technique, right? Like how to look at a book. But then you want to, to take them 5 or 10% more. You're like, okay, maybe the first couple of days at the gym, they learn the weights that they're doing. And they're like, okay, maybe you bench 135 pounds. You can do 45 on each side. But then you're like, okay, let's put 10s on each side. Let's bump that up to 155. And they're like, I'm unsure. But then you help them and you motivate them and they try. And like, you can even spot them if they need, need to. And they gain that confidence. But if you weren't there and they were kind of looking around, maybe they wouldn't try that because they were unsure because they didn't have a spotter. They didn't have someone telling them that they could do it. And if you're strong, than them they're watching you do you know 300 pounds you're like damn like i could do this like someone else is doing this and this is the same for most everything in life you get pulled up by the people around you what you're observing what you're reading what you're doing not just through pure self-will and motivation it's a very rare thing for someone to be totally self-trained and when they are in those rare instances they're mostly fueled by like massive amounts of trauma and they're like masking really uh, looking at themselves through this activity and they become the best that way or like very proficient in something. So we're looking at when we're looking at the everyday average reader, I would say most people do want more knowledge. They want to know more. They hear people like all kind of the pseudo intellectual thought leaders online right now, whether they're on the left or the right, uh, some of the big podcasters in the world, all of them have read books. All of them, you know, have read a catalog of books, whether it's fiction or nonfiction and have some knowledge. But if you're someone who's maybe read 10 or 15 books in your life, then you see them as kind of smart. You're like, wow, I want to be able to talk like that. I want, you know, for someone to bring up the Southwest and we can uh, talk about the empire, the summer, summer moon and the Comanches and kind of get into that. Or if someone brings up Russia, we can talk about um, Tolstoy or whoever, you know, and obviously a lot of people don't want to be like boy geniuses. They want to be out here. Like we're, we're doing like grinding out uh, literary theory and philosophy. But I would say, because it's a pleasurable thing to do, it makes you feel good to be able to have just a general worldliness of knowledge be able to participate in conversations with people, especially if you're just not, you know, just totally not unconscious. Like there's a whole group of people in the world who just don't care about reading at all, never will, never um, are going to, unless there's massive incentives, you know, instruct in place for them to. But everyone else who, like I said, um, has read some books before are like open to knowledge in general still. I feel like they could get set on the path with little to no effort to being able to actually access literary fiction. And I know this because I did this myself. I lifted myself up through determination. And I've helped a lot of my friends do this. I've seen people who were close to the illiter illiterate in their 30s, like learn to read and write again and like become very great thinkers. And what's also great about reading is that everyone is like an intellectual online now. Like people watch videos and like read Reddit posts. And that's the other thing. Like a lot of people still read, like whether it's YouTube comments or Reddit posts and things like that. And so our reading ability isn't totally dwindled. But when you start reading, you start realizing like, damn, videos go so slow, especially like podcasts or random things. But when you look at like, if you read a book and then look at, and you know, time yourself and you look at the audio book, you read three, four, five times faster, sometimes even faster than an audio book narration. And it almost is, in my opinion, internalized a lot more. And so you're like, man, I can access all this knowledge and go deeper. And it's more economical. Obviously, audiobooks are great for when I'm like, when I'm like cleaning the kitchen or vacuuming or doing whatever around doing laundry. I'm always got, I've got an audiobook in or a lot of the times when I'm driving. But one of the other barriers and what Wallace didn't see, and now to kind of, you know, talk about this theory though, about, you know, I don't, so we have this group of sleepers, but the problem is, is that there's something holding us back. And what's holding us back is these kind of built in excuses, these lies and this trauma that we already have. Like everybody today, like when I try to get people into reading, everybody. Everybody, like I'm a, I'm a teacher also. I teach Eng high school English, so I deal with this every single day. But so many people now have ADD, ADHD, PTSD, ZZZY, like every single thing in the world, which most of the time are excuses 
for them not to be able to read. Because even if you have one of these things, even if you can't focus, I know for a fact you could focus for a couple minutes, especially if you read something out loud, because I also teach English language learners and uh, have been doing that for years. And what I make them do is I make them leave the room or like if it's quiet, I usually make them leave the room and uh, send them under supervision of someone else and make them read out loud at a very slow pace, just for like five to 10 minutes at most, sometimes even shorter if they're really new or like kind of squirrely or like not into it. And so they read for three or five minutes out loud, something slow, something easy. Then they write about what they learned. Just a couple sentences, like, what did you just learn? They just kind of do an objective summary or just get their feelings down. And that's it for the day. But eventually you start gaining speed. Eventually, after a while, you start to remember and you could do five minutes and six minutes. So it's just like, it's just like running. You slowly condition yourself if you have one of these things and you build yourself up. You take, you know, get control of your life a little bit and get your dopamine in store. It's like there's some people who are mentally like 700 pounds in terms of like their distractibility. And like imagine like a guy who's 700 pounds. He's like, I'm gonna go run a marathon. You're like, okay, you could maybe do that. Or even say a 400 pound guy, like, okay. You could do that, but we're going to have to make some changes here. You're going to have to start walking a little bit. You're going to have to start stretching. You have to eat really good and, like, do a couple of these things. And then, like, in a year, you might be able to run a marathon. Like, it could happen, honestly. You might have to walk a little bit, but we, we could do this. But then imagine, so this person's like, okay. So and so then you go check back up on them, and they got the the bucket of KFC, and they're drinking Coke by the, you know, by the gallon. You'd be like, you're not taking this seriously. This is, and they're like, I can't run. I can't do it. Like, man, why can't I run? And something I've personally noticed that every single person that has an excuse, that has some reason why they can't read, why they can't, you know, whatever reason, most of the time, if you, when I get to know them and I look at their personal life, I'm like, you guys are not sleeping right, consuming red dye 40 every single day, your diet sucks, you're TikToking all day, you're playing video games all the time, your dopamine, uh, you're watching porn, like your dopamine is just out of control, like you don't even have any. And so that's one thing that we are dealing with is kind of just this dopamine nation that can't really handle these kind of long form things now. And that's being reinforced by literally the, st our, the structure of our society and how we socialize with others and the jobs we have to do. And I'm no better, guys. I have an addictive personality. Don't worry, I've been down my rabbit holes before. I've been to those dark places. And technology is, my God, so addicting. I have to have blockers on everything. I, I don't just block websites. I only can go to like 30 different websites. Everything on the internet is blocked except websites that are like super boring. And, and YouTube, most of the time, isn't one of them. I only can watch YouTube at like, I, anyway, I have this whole blocking system because I can't control myself. Unless I take massive control of my ADHD, I might be gone. Sometimes you don't see me. This doesn't happen as much anymore, but sometimes on this channel, like there are like two or three weeks where I maybe post like one or two videos. That's just because I'm off just totally unfocused. I've just gone off the deep end. I'm watching TV. I'm not eating right. I'm playing games. Like who knows what I'm doing? But back to Wallace's first point, writers love to make a pity party for themselves. They love to say, no one understands anymore. We can't do this. That is a lie. And you have to pull it together. I just talked about David Foster Wallace and Hunter S. Thompson in the previous video. And the main thing from that is you have to become a not a character, but you, you you have to show your personality a little bit. And if your personality sucks, then for the love of God, spend five years working on it. You're not going to be a famous author in five years. You, When you look back at your life and all the time that you wasted, one of the best investments you can make is actually becoming a likable um, person who can maybe communicate and has some form of a personality. And that's not something that um, is genetic. You can grow it. If you are weird and shy or have problems, you can go take improv classes, which may, or, you know, start smaller than that. Just start hanging out with people, trying to just make like, so being social, like the main part of your life, life. Maybe you can go get laid. I know. <laughs> okay. Let's not get too far, but maybe go, you know, learn the love, uh, the ways of love. You can try public speaking. There are like so many th different things that when you look at it over a five to 10 year time frame, like, okay, well, if I want to be a writer and I'm, it's not going to happen overnight, like, okay, I got these books. I got these ideas. This is my plan. What would be some good things other than writing for me to do? Well, be, you know, being able to do stuff because, you know, there are writing conferences. Like one day, your boy right here, I'm trying to actually get in to the David. Okay. I'll tell you guys right now. I'm trying to speak this summer in Austin at the David Foster Wallace conference and we'll see if they like my paper and what I'm talking about because it's actually nothing like super academic. It's actually about why David Foster Wallace is the ultimate person to kind of revive literature because of how deep he goes, how there's so much to talk about. Guys, I have a, a at least a couple thousand videos on Wallace I can make. The content is endless. And then if you synthesize all, so if there's like 2000 different things that we could talk about in terms of Wallace, well, okay, you just talk about him straight like I'm doing right now. But what if I took a Jungian perspective on Wallace's um 
on everything I've already done so far on Wallace or a Ronkian or a nihilistic or whatever other approach. You could just put a lens on anything and it's almost endless. And because there's so much, it's wonderful. You know, I also cover Cormac McCarthy on this channel and it's hard. You know, I've made 150 or more videos on Cormac McCarthy and the dude never said anything about writing or literature in his life. And so I spoke most of the time very straight about um, McCarthy and I, you could obviously do all those interpretations, but Wallace has so much more stuff and that's what makes him so magical. Even if you don't like him is that it creates these beautiful conversations like we're having now. Guys like Neil Gaiman or Kashua Ishiguro or Don DeLillo um, and uh, any other fiction author you could think of, most of the time you can't have these conversations stemming from the work. And that's why I like McCarthy because he's the, the pinnacle of Hemingway's iceberg theory and Wallace is just everything. You, he's just this endless source of inspiration. And the other structure that's holding writers back from being able to do this is obviously the university system because if you get a job, even if it's a community college job or a fellowship, you're getting paid to write when you actually don't deserve it. You deserve to get money when people want to come and see you talk. Like right now, you guys are watching this and I'm making money from this video or if you go join the course or buy a t-shirt from me or whatever you do, give me a donation, like however that is, or just, you know, boosting me on the algorithm, you're supporting me and I'm getting active feedback every single day. Like if I make a controversial video, I get a lot of hate comments. I get hate emails. If I do a weird thumbnail, like on one of my David Foster Wallace videos, I get three or four comments that say like, dude, I don't think that's a good thumbnail. It's like, okay, I'll change that. Like, I understand you guys, you know, help me be better. But when you're in this kind of program, you're just in a vacuum. You have all these other people who are in a vacuum. You're in a professor who's who are in, in a vacuum. All your peers are in this vacuum. And there's no one actually from the outside giving you that criticism to help you grow. Or you're not sitting in that isolation and training yourself, which is just as important. And so when these authors eventually graduate, right, and they're out in the world, they start becoming resentful. They're like, why doesn't anybody like me? Why didn't I do anything? Well, it's because you never did anything. Like everyone who I was in graduate school was with was genuinely, genuinely, okay, I can't even talk right now. They were very unlikable characters. Let me tell you guys. I have, uh, except one, my boy, Iram, Iram Gonzalez, shout out to him. But everyone else I know in graduate programs has told me a very similar thing, like stay away from the people. And it only gets worse with time. So then Wallace moves into these two different forms of writing, these two different kind of camps. The one being the avant-garde, which is like, okay, nobody understands me. And I have a lot of you guys, a lot of my audience out there. This is where you're going to fall into more. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to write for write conscious. I'm going to write for Ian. I'm going to write for these people. I'm going to show everyone that I'm the best. And it's like, no, 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 please don't show us you're the best. Show us a message. Show us a symbol. Show us a story, something beautiful, please. Being the best doesn't happen for a while. When you look at Cormac McCarthy, he didn't write Blood Meridian until his uh, mid-40s. David Foster Wallace wasn't, his, in, uh, in t wasn't writing Infinite Jest until his 30s, and he had been training for a while. He'd been training since birth to be a great author. Most of us are at least 10,000 hours, if not 20 or 30 hours behind Wallace in terms of of our training from the time he, from when he was writing Infinite Jest and you know when McCarthy or your other favorite authors were writing their best books. So you're not there yet. And so you can't really make these leaps. You can't go and try to be the best until you are accessible, until you are relevant. And Wallace had two published books and a ton of stories and nonfiction before he ever wrote Infinite Jest. McCarthy had a whole catalog. He had four other novels before Blood Meridian. And McCarthy didn't become famous until he finally realized he needed to be more accessible, that all this avant-garde stuff that he was doing, that's obviously really great now. It's like, oh my God, uh, the general populace just couldn't wrap its head around it. And you have to assume your reader has no influence. Most of your readers are are reading under 20 books a year and have their entire life. So you could, if you look at someone, they've easily read under 500 books, probably under two or 300 books when they first pick up your book. Even if they're very well read, even, you know, I know people who are plenty smart and they've read only a couple hundred books. They just have absorbed it really well and you kind of supplemented it with other inform information online and podcasts. And Wallace actually knows this because this is what happened with his first two books. The Broom of the System was this metafictional experimental novel and it fails because of that. And A Girl with the Curious Hair, a lot of the stories within the story, uh, book of short stories, are actually responses to certain authors like, a Girl with the Curious Hair is actually him mimicking Brett Easton Ellis's style. There's other um, stories in there where he's mocking certain styles or trying these things out. And it's somewhat avant-garde in that respect that he's like doing all this experimental stuff instead of just making a book of sh a, sh a short story collection that's likable. And what I think really tuned Wallace into this idea of escaping the avant-garde is having to write nonfiction pieces. So as he's writing these nonfiction pieces, he had to write for a direct audience immediately. So, you know, maybe 10,000 
people buy bought his first two books. But suddenly, if you are in Esquire magazine or Harper's or something, there's going to be a media, and there's going to, you're going to get letters, and there's going to be feedback. And so now we're in the era. Um, speaking of the other side, so it's like you know, if you try to go too avant garde and you fail, then I can at least commend you. You know, like okay, bro, like great job. We've all done that before. Don't worry. Uh, maybe you tried to make it a novel and shove it down everyone's throat, but but I've been in plenty of workshops for poetry, nonfiction, um, on my previous online publishing career where I published stuff, a lot more stuff online. This is some wacky stuff. But then there's the other side, and this has blown up really even way bigger than what we see now because of Kindle. And there's a famous book out there. Well, it's not famous, but in the self-publishing circles, it kind of kicked all this off. It's by a guy named, I think, Chris Fox. His YouTube channel. Uh, I have a weird dude because weird people write to market. I think that's what his book title was. It was like, yeah, write to market or something. And it basically was like, okay, so I have to go look at Amazon and find the holes in the system and be like, okay, Western science fiction is like really popular right now. And there's only a couple books and they don't really have good covers or like good descriptions in there. So if I could get in there. I could make a series and like do some sales, maybe get everyone in on the first one, or like the first couple chapters, you know, start doing like real marketing and researching markets and seeing what people want. So figure out that book and then, you know, figure out what you need to write and then write the book. So that like takes all the creativity out of it. And that's what somewhat happened now with all these really famous books. I heard, I think you guys heard me mention earlier, A Court of Thorn and, Thorn and Roses by Sarah J. Moss. And I read that because my wife likes the series and a lot of my students like the series. So I just blew through it because it was easy enough. Um, but she steals a lot of the stuff from Twilight and Harry Potter. It's like all the same stuff regurgitated. And I know all the stories are the same, but there's kind of a formula in fantasy and to make something really big that just works time and time again if you feed it to a, an audience of women or just people who are under the age of like 25. And now in our world of emotionally immature adults, you know, a lot of people who are 40 and under are, you know, are still reading YA and like doing all that type of stuff. And the same obviously goes for thriller books and mystery books. They can only get better. They only can get more riveted and more secular, uh, excuse me, more niche oriented to like find these certain markets of people and like serve their needs, which is fine, but it's just kind of a waste. It's like no different than watching TV, really. I mean, it's, it's more enjoyable. I will say that. Like I, I'm not, I read Walter Mosley. I read um, thrillers sometimes. Um, Wallace has some recommendations. I think Ed McCain's book Fuzz is one that he likes. Uh, I read um, it's on. And if you guys are interested, here we go. Here we go. In Wallace's favorite books, I have a free PDF down below that details over a hundred of Wallace's favorite books. And I'm actually going to update it in the next week or so. So if you get it now, I'm going to send you an email with the new version that's going to have over 500 books on it of Wallace's favorite stuff. Yes, I said 500. It's at, and it has links to everything. Some of the books have descriptions. I list all my favorites. That are on the list. Um, there are the three books that Wallace always wrote by, uh, with as he was drafting stuff. So it's a really cool resource that I'm trying to make way better and like make it look better. And it's going to get hopefully eventually it's just going to continue going up because I'm turning it into a Google Doc soon. So grab that now and then very soon you will receive an updated version from me. And you can read in, in, into Wallace's kind of fascination with these kind of these kind of more fun novels because that's something you can learn. This is what I this is why he teaches and talks about things uh, people like Tom Clancy and stuff because when you look at like the most avant-garde fiction. There's stuff we can learn. Like, holy hell, I love it, right? Like even things like Infinite Jest, maybe that are a little bit hard. It's like there's all this stuff that you can learn from it, stuff that's experimental. And if you're a writer or like a very deep reader, you can take a lot away from that. Even if, you know, 99% of other readers cannot. And the same, and it teaches you these things that you can apply back to your own writing. And the same goes for the fun stuff. You can learn how to make people, sus you know, feel suspense and do all these other great things that most other books can't do. You know, Cormac McCarthy or even David Foster Wallace a lot of the time don't get you on the edge of your seat. Um, Wallace is a little bit better at that. Honestly, McCarthy is too. But you guys get what I'm saying is that you could study kind of books that are making that its whole thing if you're struggling with that. Just like if you're not very good at dialogue, I would recommend, you know, reading 20 or 30 screenplays and like really diving into that and like looking to theater to develop your dialogue because that's all they have. And I love Wallace's idea that, you know, both of these things and people, you know, talking crap or excuse me, engaging both of these things is this contempt for the reader is viewing the reader not as this sleeping entity that needs to be awakened. That most of the time outside of these blocks, which are a whole other problem, um, is ready to learn. It's ready to grow. I should say they, not it, like it, the sleepers. This was the <laughs> but Wallace says the reader feels like someone is talking to him rather than striking a number of poses. And so if we are declining as a species 
and as readers, and maybe you can't write as something as, as difficult as you want, you can sit in the nuance of something in that middle ground because not everything that's deep actually has to be hard or complicated. And that's why it makes it deep. The simplest stuff in the world, if you go back to it, is actually the craziest. I talked about this in my David Foster Wallace and marijuana video. That is what makes us, you know, basic things are the most important things. And if you can take a different spin on some basic part of life or reality, and because we're in this ever-changing world, there's actually more things, you know, with digital technology or cryptocurrency or what's happening in politics or with people's weird fetishes or what they're doing or the exploitation of people. All these different things are new and always changing, and they're rapidly evolving in this hyper reality that we're in right now. And so, as a reader, you can act, excuse me, as a writer, you can look at any of those, and pick some of them, and write about them in somewhat of a basic way, but from a very unique angle, and then infuse a lot of that with this crazy entertaining stuff. What you could do the Sarah J. Moss, you know, steal from Harry Potter and Twilight, or steal from Tom Clancy, get all the really fun stuff, and then combine that together, and you have a pretty damn good book that's actually transformational, making um, social commentaries that matter, and you can also expose some of your beautiful prose and have these moments where it really shines and people are like, damn, that guy's a good writer. And maybe you're not writing Gravity's Rainbow or this crazy thing, but you're writing something that matters and you're writing something that's impactful now and is going to help people. And that's really what this game's all about, everybody. And Wallace knows this is hard. He says it's difficult, unbelievably difficult, confusing, and scary, but it's neat. We have this opportunity. No one else had to worry about this. Back in the day, you could just tell a story. If you did a good job, sell some books, um, do whatever you want, you know, sell some albums, and you're good. But now we have to do better. We have to engage. We have to worry about all these different things. But if you can find the patience, if you can restore your dopamine, if you can do these things in the long run, it's going to be way better. And it's not like digital technology or any of these things are going away. And so there's this new territory. There's this new land with this millennial generation of writers and even gen, uh, the Gen Zers who are unfocused, who actually aren't writing. All the writers who are saying that they're writers, including myself, you know, some of the time, I'm not actually writing as hard as I should be. I'm actually not making the progress. And so if you're able to do that, if you're putting in the work, you're going to be able to jump ahead and you're going to have this massive pool of content that you can touch that everyone else is just kind of glazing over. If you go read like a lot of journalism or like a lot of people's substacks and their analysis of media or stuff, a lot of the time it's really weak, you know, and sometimes it's really, really, really good. And that's what our generation can do. And we, we have this pinpoint ability because of fighting on Reddit and all these other things, but we're dealing with fiction. We're not dealing with nonfiction. And so if you're one of these kind of powerful internet lords, what you need to develop is that empathy that ability to connect with characters and understanding and the and the knowledge to understand how stories function and how to combine your emotions, story, and then this internet lord power all together. And when you do, I think we're going to have books that are going to be way better than Infinite Jazz, Cormac McCarthy, anything that we could ever dream of. But it's up to you guys. And that's why I'm here doing this channel. I'm I consider myself the battering ram for the future generation of writers because there's a whole group of people, whether they're going to be speaking about writing like me or um, writing really hardcore, who are going to change the world because we haven't even tapped into it yet. We have no mavens. We have no very powerful people who are talking about books. Like as I've talked about in earlier videos, if women, if you know, very attractive women or smart women got into the space, like I would be eliminated. I would have zero views. And I understand they would be like, you know, profiting off their off their off the object off their own objectification, but they would awaken a new class of people. And eventually, after a couple of these awakenings, we'd have this whole new group of people who had transcended like object objectification and like personality flaws, and they know how to edit and do all these things, and they can push books back out into the world on places like YouTube and social media, but also in the realm of writing. And so I'm trying to lead that charge and like show us all that we can do it. And the reason I get mad, people kind of critique me a lot for like talking about dumb people and saying, calling them NPCs. Well, an NPC doesn't have to be an NPC forever. And it takes less than you think, you guys. Think about your growth. Think about your major awakening because I know you had one at some point. How much work did you actually put in? For me to have this massive shake of my consciousness and everything to change in the six to 12 months that it did, looking back, I only read. I didn't read that much. I didn't do that much self-analysis. Not, not too much happened, but I had quality books. I did some quality self-analysis. I was lifted up in the right way, and that's what made all the difference. I do way more now. I'm way more dedicated now, but I get much less results because that first touch of knowledge and all that. 
really gets you to where you need to go. And most people don't need to get to the point where they're sitting there and analyzing all the books like we're doing. They just need to get over that first hump, that first hump of an educational, spiritual, um, and, and emotional awakening so that they can be productive and conscious members of society and also start to contribute and help others on that journey. And so I love each and every one of you if you guys have made it this far. Thank you guys for being on this journey with me and supporting me because I got your guys' backs. I'm never going to be on here parod parodying like terrible writers or whatever crazy political agenda everyone's on right now. I'm going to keep it straight with you guys, tell you guys what we need to do to help not just ourselves become successful and for us to accomplish our dreams, but to actually hit the larger goal because I'm shooting for something way bigger. I'm looking for an educational awakening at a global level. I'm not looking to make fiction cool again or any of this stuff. And so when you're shooting that high, which we should all be doing, that's what your work should mean. Why even write? Why not just go become an engineer or an accountant or something, some easy job that you can make money at? Um, and then develop a personal brand online and get all the girls on Instagram in or the women on Instagram and you're good, right? You don't have to worry about it. If you're trying to do that, if you're trying to be famous so that you can be remembered and get women and all these other weird writing dreams and then just stop now and go do something else. This is you're like walking up Mount Everest if like a gondola is a, was available, even though they're not. If you're gonna mount, walk up Mount Everest, do it for the people, do it for a cause bigger than yourself. And that cause is helping people make that 10% jump that we all took. And if even 10 or 20% of society took that 10% jump, everything would be different. Everything, I mean, we could never go back. It would, I can't even fathom what that would look like. Most revolutions, easily under 20%, more like 10% of the actual total population are participating. The American Revolution, I know the number is under 20%. I don't have the exact number. Participated in any manner, whether it was helping the British or helping the Americans. Most people didn't help at all. They were isolationists or like living off and like not being involved at all. And they kicked off um, a project that's still continuing to this day, that 10, 15%. And so we don't have to worry about the 90%. We don't have to worry about the worst people in reality. We just have to worry about the 10% who are still sleeping, who are ready to be awakened. And if enough of us do this, then we have enough personality types to accomplish this because I can't personally do this myself because I have my character flaws. Sometimes I say crazy things and people don't like me and I and yada, yada, yada. Or people, you know, people like different types of people and different approaches and presentation styles and editing styles or writing styles. It's, it's understandable. But if there were as many people making conscious content or writing conscious books as there are people creating, consuming, and writing like what's happening over on Book Talk, you guys don't know what the world would look like. And we let it get out of control. We got lazy. We played the video games. We didn't, you know, assert and fight back against that whole push. But we are here now, and I will see you guys in the next video where we will continue the fight.